Welcome to another podcast session with AVAX Daily and Certic. AVAX Daily, every day, as long as we have some news about the ecosystem. How does Certic do it? AVAX, great, great to be here. So uh, today, today we have Snow Cone, uh, Dow in the house, and uh, we will be learning a little bit about Dow. Um, and um, I think before we start, maybe I'll do a short intro. Um, Will with Certic, sure. uh, a global leader in... Uh, Web3 Securities, we do a lot of stuff like code audit, um, chain monitoring, uh, in short, making things safe. Um, maybe we'll do a quick roundtable. Uh, Snow Cone, if you could give a short blur of uh, your background, that would be appreciated. Yep, so we have, um, on this side, we have uh, myself, Kyle, and also also Kyle. It's uh, you know unfortunate for rooms like this, but it's the way it is. <laughs> you can all refer to me as Kyle 1 and him as Kyle 2. And uh, my background is, uh, uh, I have a, I guess, college background in engineering, moved on to, you know, working with securities on the blockchain. And now I've just gone uh, uh, full-blown crypto degen dev. And, wow. And okay. You, so? we have yeah. Like a, a call to the call? Is he using a separate account? No, he's here. Go oh, on. no, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Um, so I, I started back in 2018. Um, have been contributing to uh, various different like protocols, I guess, once DeFi Summer came along and then uh, met uh, my business partner here and we just started building on projects and I guess DAO seemed the most interesting and had the most amount of runway for the next couple of years. Great. Right. So you guys are like roommates, uh, so you knew each other from college and now you're doing like a project together, is that right? Uh, no, we met, we met online through, I guess, Telegram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was working with... Uh, I was working with his father on a, um, a real estate project, and uh, you know, through that, we—that's uh, how we met. Wow, building trust through real estate—that's fascinating. Was that residential real estate or commercial real estate, by any chance? The um, uh, the platform, uh, the objective was to uh, tokenize real estate, and uh, his his father is a developer building, um, or you know, a land developer who builds you know tons of houses and other kind of structures you know whatever and we wanted to give uh individuals who did not have experience with you know flipping homes or developing real estate the ability to simply um uh, invest in these projects at any given time you know because if you make a liquid market around a speculative asset you can invest in it you know a day prior or at the very beginning and you can have you know fluid entries and exits and i think it would be a real uh, a real benefit to have something like that we just ran into some few a few uh, legal hurdles that we we couldn't overcome yeah that's very yeah. interesting very fascinating okay yes. um i think we can start the ma right away shall we guys i think they all could yeah okay sure um so uh, let's dive in into dow for a sec so uh, when when we look at dow um you know someone was saying there's so many choices out there these days um what really differentiates snowcomb dow uh, or maybe someone wants to start their own DAO by themselves. Can you just comment a little bit about, you know, what is Snowcone DAO and what makes you guys unique from any other DAOs out there? Well, I wouldn't want to be, um, I wouldn't want to have Snowcone compared to any other any other DAO. I'd, uh, you know, probably tighten that to focus on DAO creation platforms because it's kind of like, you know, comparing uh, Coca-Cola to Tesla, you know, like there's so many types of DAOs, you can't compare some of them, at least not uh, objectively. But Wait. as far as DAO creation, uh, were you going to say something? Uh, uh, no, go ahead. Okay, as far as uh, DAO creation platforms, though, I um, I think maybe about two years ago at this point, I was on one of them, I can't remember which, but uh, it's a, you know, simple little interface, you put in a few details and it deploys the contracts for you and yeah, that's uh, that's neat. That's useful, but it's uh, at least when I was presented with my dashboard for uh, you know the the DAO I just deployed, I got hit with this very you know uh, daunting feeling of like, okay, what what am I supposed to do now? You know, it's like you uh, you, know, you start a company on on LegalZoom. There's things you have to do after the actual uh, deployment or creation of the DAO, and that's the hard part, not the uh, development of an interface. So uh, our focus has been to not only, you know, provide that service, but also provide um, 
uh, after the fact services on, uh, you know, tools to help users build their community, reach their community, uh, market, plan, strategize, coordinate, you know, so the things you would find in, in uh, normal Web2 uh, project management platforms or uh, organizational SaaS platforms, things like that. They're just not uh, present in Web3. Okay, okay. It's, it's, it's great that you kind of helped us to um, granularize uh, the, the type of DAO um, universe there. I mean, um, there are talks about different type of DAOs, like there's, you know, collector DAOs, philanthropy DAOs, protocol DAOs, investment DAOs, and grant DAOs. Maybe there are more to that. Could you kind of connect the dots for us, like in terms of how DAO creation can um, kind of map into that ecosystem by any chance? Well, at the end of the day, I suppose I'd say what a, um, a DAO at its root is just a, a multi-sig wallet. You know, you have uh, a methodology for strangers to coordinate. And with something that broad, uh, you know, a DAO in uh, legacy terms would uh, be defined as any any kind of group doing anything. It could be a Fortune 500 company or it could be an after-school, you know, track club or something, any type of coordinated uh, uh, mechanism, really. And from that, you know, there's obviously benefit to, uh, you know, distilling that further, you know, clubs, guilds, uh, you know, so, uh, pseudo-corporate entities. Um, you know, there's uh, a methodology behind the formation that reflects the objective. And uh, I don't know if it... Uh, did I answer the question? Might be going on a tangent here. Okay. Um, yep. All right. Well, but uh, I have some questions about the answers you just gave. Uh, yeah, you said that you know before you participated in this DAO and it has like a simple um, interface, right? You can deploy a smart contract, but not much can be done from there. No instructions whatsoever. So, can you maybe touch on a little bit about the type of tools that um, Snowcone DAO can offer to the users that uh, are more advanced to this previous uh, DAO creation platform? Yeah, I have a. I have a really simple one. If you, uh, you know, if you're an individual and you want to, uh, you want to start it out, and um, let's say you, you know, deploy your contracts, you have your, uh, you know, tokenomics in place and what you're doing, all that stuff, which is another bear by itself. But let's say you want to run run an airdrop, right? You don't have any coding experience. What does it take to run a proper airdrop and you know give it the ability to scale? Assuming you get more than a hundred people. You have to, uh, you have to have a website. You have to have, um, or I, I guess I should have honed in on a uh, uh, task-oriented airdrop. You know, like retweet this and like this, join this, you know, whatever, and collect your collect your airdrop. You have to, uh, you have to create a form. You have to collect user information. You have to uh, whitelist the addresses of the people that complete the objectives for certain, you know, differential amounts. And then you have to um, then you have to run it on time. All that stuff for something seemingly simple for someone who doesn't know how to code is a uh, that's a big deal, and it could be problematic trying to get that off the ground in any kind of uh, effective way. So one of the tools <clears throat> users are going to be presented with right out of the bat is the uh, ability to uh, you know create a, a bespoke airdrop for their users with. Tons of different tasks and you know automation surrounding the completion of those tasks tied to specific wallet addresses uh, whitelisted to your DAO contract. So now it's just a matter of coming up with the objectives you want and the token allotments you want to provide, and you know just plug and play. I think that's a really simple uh, simple example of the kind of things you're going to be offering. All right. So like mostly uh, you will do like all the back end kind of thing uh, and then the the projects they only need to do like to add which tokens all right that's nice um any comments guys yeah no i just think that's really cool because i mean i'm not i'm not a doubt expert by any means but i think it's a very cool concept that can be used in a lot of different areas but the problem is that as you mentioned like it's not an easy thing for an old person to be like oh yeah i'm just gonna start this no crypto experience no coding experience like that's one of the main hurdles and I think solving that opens DAOs up to just a lot of different areas that it could benefit. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely there's definitely a formula to uh, to this stuff. It's not, you know, there's no formula for uh, success, but there are definitely, uh, I think, uh, there's room for best practices when it comes to 
the formation of DAOs and, you know, interacting with your community efficiently. And, uh, you know, that's what, that's what we're tackling. Right. And so just, I guess, uh, yeah. I guess just out of curiosity, while we're here with AVAX Daily, of course, is what went into your decision to uh, build on Avalanche instead of any other blockchains? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, I have some fans of, I'm, I'm a fan of a, a, a handful of protocols and, you know, there's, there are certain trade-offs for different chains. Take, um, you know, take Ethereum, for example. It's a, uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very large, very secure blockchain. And I think that the, uh, the benefit of that uh, security is you can um, execute on, I guess, broadly speaking, any type of transaction with relative certainty that <clears throat> you're safe from any kind of uh, external attack vectors, namely, you know, nation states, governments, things that are, uh, you know, pushing, you know, groups like uh, Coin to freeze USDC and, and wallets. You know, it's the kind of that's kind of security you get from from Ethereum. But I just don't think uh, I don't think DAOs are in a place uh, currently where those types of threats necessitate the additional expense required to operate on such large chains. And uh, you know, obviously. Uh, if for no other reason, you know, AVAX is a, a smaller chain, it's much more nimble, uh, the transactions are much quicker, and it's, uh, it promotes a much more, uh, you know, move, move fast and, and break things mentality for, you know, agile development of this new, this new space. You know, it's hard to uh, iterate and test on things that are prohibitively expensive to iterate and test on. And, you know, a, a chain as, as agile as AVAX, you know, presents that opportunity. I see. And, you know, I think let's touch on that also, because you said, you know, um, uh, AVAX is nimble, is fast in terms of transaction speed, um, and it's scalable as well. Uh, but then there are still some sort of, I, I believe, you know, DAOs uh, in other chains, right? Not just in AVAX, but in, you know, most of the chains, they have problems with it. And uh, the recent problems with, you know, if uh, we, if I say his name correctly, like Soland, um, you know, where the whales are doing all the other stuff to manipulate the contracts, right, and to manipulate the, the proposals. So, you know, that's why we're kind of holding this um, podcast session with Certic to ensure the security to, well, to actually um, give people some insights into the security of things. And that includes DAO, right? So, Snowcone and uh, Certic, too, if you guys want to jump in, um, what are some kind of existing problems that you see with, you know, DAOs in general? Well, I guess um, uh, overly complicated uh, token mechanics can uh, possibly lead users to, uh, you know, feel a, a potentially false sense of sophistication. You know, coming coming from the uh, uh, the, the DAO or the contracts they're working with. You know, like if the token mechanics are really complicated, you know, they must be legit. Kind of. I think that's probably a feeling some people get. When in actuality, almost across the board, the more uh, you know, sophisticated the token mechanics, the more um, uh, the more nefarious those token mechanics. You know, so there are certain things that we're working on a tool now to you know delineate the type of contracts used in these uh, for these, I guess, uh, nefarious purposes. Though that's a pretty strong word to use, but whatever. But you look at something like bonding curves. You know, most people don't really understand bonding curves or how they work, though uh, most of the time they're used to asymmetrically benefit the, uh, you know, contract deployers or the issuers, whoever. But, you know, when it comes to like a simple DAO, like a, a multi-sig, it's very, it's very one-to-one. -one. You know, you have a token, you have a, you have a vote or a say, but with the introduction of complexity, you start to stray away from that for, you know, asymmetrical benefits. So anyway, we've been cataloging the uh, uh, mechanisms used in uh, DAOs with, let's say, a, a bad rap and trying to find patterns or uh, repetition of these certain types of contracts. And if DAOs deploy uh, using any of these contracts, we will give users, at least on our platform, um, you know, certain tags or color codes to look for uh, that say, you know, we don't necessarily say this is a bad DAO, but this contract they're using in their dependencies is almost always used for bad things. So that's one way we're trying to tackle that problem. 
So that's like red alarm from Binance recently, huh? Yeah, it is. I actually I heard about that today, and I was like, God, God damn it, <laughs> they they were slightly slightly ahead of us on that, but you know we're we're still iterating. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. Chance, do you have anything to add? In? Yeah. No. Just that was an interesting point you brought up about people think the more complex something is, like, oh yeah, like they just more blindly trust it, I guess, which is just something I want to make sure people are aware of. Is like, I mean, as you said, sometimes the more simpler infrastructure is what works best and i think people kind of get carried away and just because a lot of people don't understand i mean i don't even really understand contracts and all that stuff but like just be aware like for users just be aware um as you mentioned like just because something something seems complex and confusing doesn't mean you should just be like oh yeah it's good enough yeah, definitely a, a hard thing to uh to enforce i think i guess as, as an aside uh, i think that's where zeal comes from in the space you know people are uh, individuals can get extremely zealous about their their chains, the projects that they're invested in. And I think it comes from a uh, lack of understanding because you know if you invest in something but don't fully understand it, your only option uh, to feel good about your investment is to have faith in that investment. And so that faith turns into zeal, and then that turns into uh, you know getting rugged. Okay, so uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Will, but I I I'll just have to ask the guys. There's no kind of little bit of questions here. So you said, yeah, okay. Um, I agree that the the more complex thing seems, uh, maybe it's hard to sustain it, right? But um, so what if so you're saying like uh, when it comes to DAO, the simpler it is, the better it is. Right? Is that correct? And so, what are the ways for these kind of very uh, complex protocols and DeFi protocols to set up a DAO? Like, what are the the, the ways for them to kind of sustain it? Like, how do you sustain it when they have these things are very complex? Uh, well, just to just to backtrack, I'm not. I wasn't trying to say that uh, complexity is bad, but mm -hmm. typically, you know, the uh, it, it's harder to pull things with with simple mechanics. But uh, that doesn't mean there's not room for uh, doesn't mean there's not room for complexity. And what was the uh, what was the second part of the question? Um, I was asking, like, okay, so for these very complex um, DeFi protocols, they have, you know, bond, they have staking, they have all kinds of token mechanisms. So how do they, how can they, like, create a sustainable DAO? And maybe if you can touch on how Snowcone can assist them in doing so, that would be nice. Well, um, I think uh, this, is a, this is a deep question, yeah, uh, but the way that people... Uh, view DAOs currently. I, I think that most people liken them to uh, the you know new type of uh, corporate entity or organization. And uh, the problem is that the way DAOs are, are structured at their core, you know, you can add onto uh, you can add onto the the multi sig idea with you know as much complexity as you want. But uh, at the end of the day, you have you arrive at a horizontal structure. You know, it's a, a DAO is essentially just a large, uh, you know, board of directors slash, you know, shareholders. And it's going to be hard, if not impossible, to mimic things done, you know, in, in the, the legacy uh, corporate environment with that kind of structure. Take something like, take something like building a car. Um, you know, look at, you know, Volkswagen, very vertical structure, you know, huge organization has tons of overhead and employees and everything. And to uh, try to breed that vertical sense of, uh, you know, responsibility, you know, managers, you know, get paid to show up and do their jobs, manage people. To try to, to attempt to achieve that, you need, you need verticality. And so you need a, uh, you, you need to create a DAO structure that is inherently more, I guess, I guess, coerced into being vertical rather than horizontal. And we have created a structure around this. We call them, we call them fractal DAOs, uh, which, which we can get into, but they are a little, they're just a little complicated. I don't, I don't want to run up time just talking about nerd shit if, uh, you know, that's going to kill the room or anything. But, but yeah, at the end of the day, you know, if you have a horizontal structure and you have one guy voting, one guy not voting, everyone's equally staked, then, then why vote? Why do anything? You're all in the same boat. Who cares? Greater commons problem. You know, it's just, uh, it's just not a way to create a successful business, if that's your goal. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, so it's, it's impossible to create a, a vertical kind of, uh, kind of structure. Um, all right. 
um, if you want to achieve that kind of success. So um, can you touch on a bit about the security of these DAOs then? Um, like if a DAO is created in such a way, um, are they secured? You know, maybe are there any ways to exploit such a system? The, um, uh, the large majority of DAOs are built off of, uh, you know, pretty, pretty standardized methods. Uh, you know, almost all of them are uh, using predominantly uh, open Zeppelin contracts for, for their deployment. So I think they're relatively secure in that sense. However, uh, their, their largest attack vector comes from just uh, end users uh, trusting the um, uh, the issuers or the creators of the DAO, and I think I think by highlighting uh, to end users the presence of, <clears throat> uh, I guess we'll say, uh, asymmetry in the structure, I think is going to be it's going to go a long way to to helping people understand what they're getting involved in. You know, namely, uh, if you were looking to invest in a DAO and you're on their uh, a web page, you know, reading about them, and there was a big tag that said you know, the owners of this DAO can rug you. Like, that would be that would be helpful for people. Uh, but there's nothing like that currently that I'm aware of, except maybe uh, Binance is saying, which I haven't looked at yet. Yeah, so that's something I wanted to touch on, because at Certic, we do kind of a yearly wrap-up of exploits, trends, all that stuff that we see in the previous year. And we did one for 2021. And funny enough, for DeFi, the most common, like, attack vector, if you want to call it that, or, like, issue was centralization issues which, I mean, it's decentralized finance, but who no one really sticks to that much anymore. And with decentralization being a key part of DAOs, I was curious, like, do you guys see that as an issue often, like the kind of centralized entities that have too much power over, say, the funds or anything like that? Well, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's an issue of what, uh, what I was talking about earlier. You know, you want to... Uh, I'd like to remove the notion of, uh, you know, guilds and, and clubs and fund DAOs, I guess, things that aren't for profit, because that's a 100% uh, viable, uh, you know, uh, structure. But uh, you have ambitious individuals creating DAOs in the hopes of making money. However, with this horizontal structure that they are prone to, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of hard, if not, uh, you know, impossible to make a business model out of that, which is why you have things uh, kind of devolve into into guilds. So the only other option is to try to get your money up front, you know, come up with, here's a really, you know, clever staking mechanism. And, uh, you know, we, we promise to do what we say we're going to do with it, whatever. But um, if if the, the base idea itself is doomed from the start, then, you know, what, are, what other option do do these users have for these individuals they they don't really have any so they tend to just rug rug their users and they make money and no one else does but that's the only incentive at this point yeah one i mean so at certic we've audited a number of DAOs. um is smart contract audit something you guys recommend to people you work with or is it curious how that works on you guys end um we uh we're not well i'll just say that's that's outside of our our scope for now we uh would like to bring in you know third parties like yourselves to add to our uh plug-in ecosystem for users who want to you know maybe do things that are uh a little a little more edgy you know like some new uh new contract or contract methodology comes out and they want to implement it but they aren't sure about the ramifications of it just a little bit more than a standard multi-sig ERC-20 setup, then, you know, it makes sense to uh, have an audit done. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's not something we intend to provide directly at this point. All right. So what you were saying um, is that, so for a DAO, right, for a DAO, if just simply a DAO, then a smart contract uh, audit is not very necessary. Um, the thing that we should look out for is actually the issuers or the creators of these DAOs. Um, they can just ruffle people for profits. Um, and so if that's the truth, right, if that's the truth, what are some of the, maybe some of the red flags that the investors or the participants of these DAOs can look out for in a DAO? That's like, oh, that, that man is going to rock us. Just go ahead and run away. I think the, um, I think the biggest red flag is uh, 
uh, just, uh, you know, a, asymmetrical structuring. If, if the creator has privileges that other investors do not beyond just, uh, you know, proportional privileges, such as having, you know, more, more votes, I guess. Uh, but if the creator has asymmetrical privileges that, you know, it's kind of a, uh, in, in reconcil a, a non-reconcilable red flag, in my opinion, like, uh, um, and also, I guess, beyond, beyond that, the, the ability to add asymmetrical privileges in the future is also a pretty big red flag. Okay. And, yeah. okay I'm sorry, Chance, go ahead. Uh, I'll just say it for sure. And I mean, that's something where I think a third party like Certic or something could, because we do the audits, but we also do um, our KYC, which is, I mean, it kind of um, makes the project owners have some skin in the game. So like, if that is an issue, users could recommend they get KYC through us, preferably, but anybody. And I mean, we don't dox like their identity or anything. We securely store it, but then it kind of gives users that next level of trust. Like, all right, they do have some skin in the game. If they do something nefarious, people have their information, they can go after them, that kind of thing. So that's just something I could see being implemented along with smart contract audits, of course, into the DAO ecosystem to kind of give users that next level of trust because especially now, I mean, this year, the amount of rug pulls, scams, I mean, I see it daily from users talking about it and stuff. So that's just one of the big hurdles I see from like adoption angle is just all the bad things you see about cryptos, like the scams, the rug pulls. So it's just something I wanted to throw in that something like a smart contract audit bundled with KYC could really give users that trust that might be missing from those asymmetrical setups you mentioned. Yeah. It's like the, uh, uh, the crypto version of the Better Business Bureau. You know, it's uh, if, if it becomes something that people know to care about, then it becomes something that the uh, issuers are incentivized to implement. So, you know, say in the future, uh, you know, CERDIC becomes like the BBB and their seal of approval is, you know, a thing that people reference for a sense of security, then it would make sense for you know, the, the creators to uh, get that get that seal of approval. And, you know, by way of doing that, you t trend towards having a safer ecosystem. Oh, okay. So they're saying that Sertic is not a seal of approval now. You guys have to step up your game, man. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm saying that if, uh, if it becomes uh, recognized to the point where, uh, you know, it's an obvious reference point for the legitimacy of a business similar to how, the Better Business Bureau operates in America, then at that point, the, the seal is something that, uh, you know, issuers will pursue rather than, uh, you know, like a, uh, an additional security measure, I guess. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense to me. And that's one thing we've been trying to kind of, because a lot of times the project owners won't want to do it. And I mean, valid, like, I guess if you have personal reasons, whatnot, like, but that's one thing we're trying to push to the community is like, cause a lot of, I mean, DAOs are community driven for the most part. And, so we just want to get that word out. Is like, this just secures you even more. Like, you might trust the devs. It might be anonymous. Cool. We, we keep them anonymous. We don't do anything on docs. We don't do anything like that. But just having that next level of trust. It's like, all right, well, because we recently had a um, project that we KYC that rug pulled, I forget, Zor or Eno or something. But, and now, I mean, we've sent everything to the authorities. We've really shipped the FBI. And, like, now they're being held accountable. So, like, I do agree with that kind of. Best, better Business Bureau Association you made. I just think it's a good thing. I mean, everyone has their own opinions on it, but I think that is a good thing for adoption and trust in the space, especially for DAOs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just a little add-in. I'm uh, sorry for the joke. <laughs> you know, it was not... Guys, I have, you know, contact with... Light. Yeah, yeah, I have contacts with uh, legit authorities, and so if a project would do KYC with them, I would probably trust them. Um, so that's a, that's my thing only. I don't know if, if anyone's like me. Um, all right, so let's uh, move on to, um, I guess, another question about that, because as you said, right, um, okay, so if um, a KYC is like a seal approval, then uh, the creators would pursue uh, to do that. So w would you say that the, the creators who publicly refuse to do these KYCs like I don't know I know that they may not have like bad intentions but do you see that as a red flag like the community asked them to do KYCs with certain like third parties but they continuously refuse to do so um I think it I mean it all depends I mean I don't want to straight out say it's a red flag I mean everyone has their own personal beliefs and opinions on it but I think like a, a good thing to do for like projects is if they get an audit because then in the audit we is like we highlight any centralization issues 
So then, say, community looks at the audit, sees that there's a centralized authority and they have control over X or Y. And then that could be reason for the community to be like, all right, well, you have your reasons for being centralized in this way, but we'd like you to be KYC just to give that next level of assurance. Because if you have control, too much control over this, then that just kind of gives the next level of trust. But I mean, I don't know your thoughts, Kyle, but that's kind of how I look at it. If there's a reason for them to be like the community to be worried and then the founders or project owners still refuse, then I would personally be a little sketched out by that. I could see, um, I mean, I could see reasonable cases being made uh, depending on the, the scope of the, of the audit. I think, you know, there's a large, uh, you know, portion of the community that is very, um, we'll say anti, anti-establishment, anti, which would include, you know, KYC and could make a compelling, compelling case for not getting audited in that way specifically, uh, but surrounding the, um, you know, highlighting of centralization issues or uh, direct contract audits, aside from lack of funding, I can't think of a reasonable reason why uh, someone someone wouldn't want to do that. So, um, yeah, yeah, I guess that's all, that's all I have. Yeah, that's one thing we're, I mean, because I'm a big component of, like, the anonymous anonymous and like the whole thing is kind of like the ethos of crypto what made it is like we're always very careful on that end and that's why whenever i talk about kyc i always make sure to say like no we don't talk to you your information is never shared so i totally understand that point there's reasons uh, we've touched on this in different discussions of like why someone wouldn't want to be doxxed depending on where you live could be a security issue like safety issue and that kind of stuff so i definitely do agree and that's why i always have like, the, usually the first thing I say when, we, when I mention KYC is that we don't dox you, like, your information's never released. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, um, so Will, do you want to add in anything before we move on? Yeah, um, I think we talked about the asymmetry and also um, um, in terms of determining the asymmetry. Um, I guess, Kyle, uh, from your standpoint, um, what, what what are some sort of quick uh, limit, limits test on to determine if asymmetry structure are in play and how do we validate that? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I think um, I think the most obvious thing to look for is uh, uh, oh, uh, really high staking rewards. I think that's a, a pretty a, a pretty big red flag that uh, funds are being used for something with the uh, you know absence of intention around those funds being. Uh, returned. It's just kind of a Peter to pay Paul Ponzi setup. Um, that's you know, usually that's just a, a quick and dirty one. But um, uh, what, what else? Kyle, do you have any? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's another good litmus test. I guess just um, if you read through if you read through the uh, docs or information, or if there's a lack of information surrounding the structure of the DAO or the contracts uh, are not certified. Um, but uh, yeah, if you read if you read through the docs and you find that you have no idea what you just read, that's probably um, that's probably bad. That probably means that they're doing something complex. So you see crazy crazy algorithms, but they're not doing anything crazy. Then that's that's a red flag. Those are just uh, you know advanced tokenomics to achieve you know an end goal of of asymmetry. Uh, however, you know you look at something like Uniswap. Obviously, what they're doing is very complex, and so. It necess- necessitates complex algorithms, but yeah, I, I guess that's just me spitfiring on on some things I might look for. Thanks for sharing that insight and perspective, and that leads me to a kind of a related question, which is most folks are thinking about APYs uh, yield, um, and you mentioned high staking is potential risk for asymmetry. What do you think is um, a reasonable or maybe a sustainable sort of APY? For your clients or for folks in general when they're looking at APY drawing this point of time for DAOs? I was like, come up with something. I think uh, it'd be some metric that took into account maybe uh, inflation rates, interest rates, and uh, more abstractly, I guess, growth of that ecosystem. But, you know, if I just threw a number out there, just inflation and interest rates you're looking at. Uh, about 12 to 15 percent, assuming inflation is still nine percent anyway. And 
anything anything far beyond that is is suspect, especially if there is no product or service behind it. You know, you take uh, she was Uniswap again. They're obviously making a lot of money on transaction fees, so it makes sense that they could offer a competitive AD, APY. However, if you have a DAO that doesn't really do anything but be a DAO and it's offering an APY of you know 30 percent, you have to ask yourself where that money is coming from and if there's you know not a not an obvious revenue source other than other people staking then you found yourself in a ponzi yeah that's one thing we recently put out a blog post was like red flag like red flags the users can look for when investing in a new project or anything it's like one thing we highlighted was like marketing traps essentially like you know they're promising the hundred thousand percent apy there you there's literally no product like you read the white paper you still don't understand what the point of it is and that kind of stuff so like i just want users to always kind of whether you take that from us or whoever just always kind of keep in the back of your head that there are things to look for sketchy things that you should be wary of right and uh on this topic i think let's give uh, the audience an example so that they can uh, better imagine things um a wonder wonderland time right it's a one a, a a uh, fork of Olympus DAO, I believe, and back in the January and February, they kind of failed because um, the APRs they promised like eight thousand, and then uh, you know I I won't go into the details of all this DeFi, but yes, I absolutely believe and agree that eight thousand uh, percent APR is cannot cannot sustain, right? Um, but I'm, I'm I'm trying to refer to the DAO kind of aspect of things because back then when things are you know failing, the token price is increasing, they they kind of uh, put out two proposals. One is to just, you know, continue the project, uh, continue developing, doing it. And the second proposal is to just, you know, kill the project, right? And I believe the, the majority of the people vote to continue the project, right? Uh, but then the, the creators of the project actually just go the other way and kill the project anyway. So um, to you, uh, Sunoko, um, I want to know that um, uh, the lack of trust in those who was behind the project ultimately led to, you know, the, the investors stay away. Do you guys offer your own KYC or do you planning to obtaining like a KYC badge in the future so that, so that the projects that build a, a DAO with you guys, um, the investor can make sure that, okay, they are KYC with you? Well, it's sort of... Um, uh... I guess it's not really it's not really of our our, our angle of approach. Our uh, uh, focus is around uh, what's the word uh, promoting promoting structures that are uh, uh, symmetrical. I guess uh, you know s structures in which uh, reliance on a centralized party is you know a a, uh, a non-issue. Right. The reason the reason that these projects you know, uh, would benefit would benefit from KYC from the issuers stems from the presence of asymmetry in that issuer's power in the ecosystem. However, if you're operating in a uh, you know a fair system or a fair organization, then uh, the uh, issuer or largest stakeholder, even if they have the largest stake in the project, um, they still have. Um, an equivalent and proportional downside in the project failing. But that's only in the case that the, the system is, you know, fair or symmetrical. So uh, we're trying to, you know, just root that problem out entirely and, you know, create systems where uh, people can actually interact in decentralized ways without having to know or rely on people on the other end. Right, gotcha. So, yeah, basically, you just offer the tools, right, um, and you leave it to the creators to uh, decide whether they want to rock the investors or not. Um, but that's, of course, that's not your responsible. You provide the tools, and uh, you know, the, the, it's the the people's fault, the humans' fault, if they use it in the kind of malevolent kind of in, with in malevolent intention. Um, all right. So, you know, I have well, with, with one with, with the addition of highlighting that to users, you know, making it not a uh, you know, a, a nebulous thing they have to just uh, figure out for themselves. We want to highlight to users, uh, you know, hey, this DAO is doing this thing, and this thing has been used for sketchy things in the past. Are you sure you want to, you know, go through with it? And if they say yes, then yes, that's on them. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, trying to uh, present all the information available, but yeah, at the end of the day, it is up to the user. Right. Um, okay, so guys, do you have any uh, additional information you want to add? before we move on to the third segment, which is the community questions.
I'm good. All right. We're good here. All right. So I guess let's uh, move on to the, the third segment, which is the community questions that I see some people asking their questions. Okay, guys, if you have any questions at all about uh, the DAO, how to set it up, how to run like a pro, um, you know, just go ahead and request to speak and uh, we'll try our best to answer them. Um, right now, let's pick Waso as a speaker. And remember to give Snowcone and Sergio a follow on Twitter and also join the Montelegram channel and Discord as well. Thank you, guys. So, what's up? Wassel, you're now unmuted. What is your question, please? I saw he was requested for a while. I might not even know it. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, thank you for the music then. Um, let's add <laughs> Monetary Revolution. All right, let me mute Wassel first. All right. Yeah, I removed him. Monetary, you're now unmuted. Watch the request it again. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I Hold think on. it might just be to get him at the top of the list to get some followers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There are people actually doing that? That's crazy. Can you guys hear me? You got to do what you can. All right. Nice. There you are. Hey, guys. Hey, Wazo. Hey, guys. How's everyone doing? Good. Wait. Very good. So what is your question? Not really so much a question, but I did want to share just like some like some things I've come across in terms of like like DAO structures and, and just kind of like best practices. Um, would it be okay if I share and gauge kind of the opinion of the audience and maybe some of the speakers? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so um, definitely not a shill by any means, um, but there's a product out there called EverOwn. EverOwn is a smart contract locker where, so a lot of the scans that take place in DeFi, regardless of what chain you're on, right, typically is the developing team will make smart contract changes or, you know, they could pull the liquidity, but that's kind of like a separate issue. But what everyone is, is it's a decentralized tool where the developer can lock their smart contract in a decentralized locker, meaning there's completely, you know, no human uh, trust required. And anytime the dev wants to reclaim access to the smart contract, a DAO vote begins. And, um, you know, basically the dev would go reclaim access. He'd put, you know, what he's looking to change. A snapshot is taken of all of their wallet holders and their weighted values. And a vote begins, um, you know, and the idea is that, you know, devs can either, you know, be a single dev, even if it's in a multi-sig, you know, there's, there's teams that, you know, often conspire against their community and their investors. I just kind of wanted to gauge kind of like, um, you know, the speakers here and what they think of, you know, are tools like this needed? you know, for DeFi to continue to grow and for, you know, DAOs themselves, you know, to continue to grow as well. It's, um, uh, I suppose I'd have to look at it to, you know, be certain, but it sounds to me like a uh, gimmicky interpretation of a proxy pattern. And, you know, a proxy is just a contract that owns the contracts that, you know, the, the users can... Uh, submit transaction through to you know make action happen and the uh, ideal the ideal setup you know if a, a DAO or any smart contract is being set up properly is to uh, you know store the state in the proxy the state being the amount of you know tokens everyone has uh, relative to that to that contract and then <clears throat> as you iterate on the contracts you uh, are essentially removing the prior list of functions and replacing it with a new list of functions to interact with the pro with the proxy. And those uh, uh, additions or changes uh, would ideally go through some kind of uh, quorum with the, with the users of the DAO. Uh, so there's not really the potential in that scenario for a, uh, uh, an individual or group to, 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 move the state or cheat people in any meaningful way because it's all stored in the proxy, which is, uh, you know, like a, a seems like a parallel between the, the proxy and the locker. I'm not sure if there's any other differences, but it doesn't sound like there are. So, um, all yeah, right. I mean, I, you, I believe the pattern is correct, but. Yeah, no, you hit it right on the head. It's, uh, it's basically a, the locker is more or less a smart contract with a DAO voting module on it. 
um, and the ownership of, you know, whatever token it is gets sent to that locker. Um, you know, that locker is created, like a smart contract is created for like each project, for example, that, that uses this tool. You know, there's, there's just, we, when we built this tool, we really tried to like think of how do we allow projects to continue, you know, things like adding a secondary wallet, you know, that can come in and reclaim the contract should God forbid something happen to the dev. But again, like I, this isn't a shill. I just, I really wanted to get like everyone's opinion. Also we're on Avalanche as one of our chains as well. And just kind of curious just like what the overall thoughts these days is around like smart contract security. Um, really that was, that was really my thoughts. Was. Thank you guys for letting me up here. Thank you so much, Quazzo, and you coming to the right place. Uh, I mean, we're holding this uh, kind of session, uh, I would say weekly now. Uh, it was monthly, but now it's weekly. Um, and so, you know, if you can, you're free to maybe uh, tune in and uh, share your opinions, um, you know, in our next, M oh, I'm sorry, podcast. Uh, but right now I have to give the other people some chance to speak. Um, right. So, Monix Harry. You guys are from another project called Octane, yeah? Do you have any questions for the, the snow cone and so also for Assertic in general? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened last time I came up as a speaker. I think my uh, audio was going in and out. Apologies for that. Just a quick question for the panel here. Um, we're, we're, we're revolving around DAOs. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Assertic. Um, I've been in the space since 2016, so love what you guys are doing. Uh, you guys are really crushing it. It's really hard because I run Octane, which is actually a listener as well. But it's really hard to find really good auditing, um, you know, companies that actually have a brand that you can trust because with being in, in decentralized finance or, you know, running and marketing and, and developing projects, it's really difficult to find that that auditing partner that can really come through for my clients. So I'd love to talk with you offline, Sertic, about how we can work together in some capacity if you're available for that. But on a, on a different note here um, regarding DAOs. What are you guys' thoughts on the future of the sustainability of, like, you know, social currencies as well as, you know, um, community-developed projects surrounding DAO? So when I, when I say that, I mean, like, the educational curve is really high to even just get into crypto in general right now. But on the back end, like, for example, like elastic rebasing, right? So if you had a token economics model that worked with a DAO, the problem is the voting structures and the rights right now are just not set up properly. So how would you guys go about creating an actual currency or being a part of a currency from auditing as well as from an AVAX perspective, Love Avalanche as well. Um, what would you guys do to actually create sustainability with DAOs for the actual user base to feel like they're not only a part of something, but there couldn't be like a 51% attack on the DAO and then every, all the funds get disseminated and the price drops or crashes or whatever. Um, so what would a sustainable DAO look like to the panel? Well, I think... Um... Uh, speaking to the currency side of things, um, I won't even touch on the the um, the elastic part of it, but I do have tons of thoughts on that as well. Uh, the <clears throat> a currency's value, you know, it's probably most of us know, is uh, derived from its um, you know utility or acceptance among the people interacting with it, and there's a fundamental problem in my opinion with uh, the with attempting to just create a currency it's kind of like trying to sell uh, you know uh, video game skins for a game that doesn't exist you know you can you can hop on you know whatever you can hop on rocket league and you know there's some uh, some sick wheels you want and you you buy them right you're getting a digital product whatever it's for no other reason than to I don't know feel good about your car with the people you're playing with however um you know if there was just someone selling the idea of owning wheels or something in the future uh for a game that didn't exist it'd be a, a much much harder sell and the marketplace would be far less successful so trying to just introduce currency uh, seems like the wrong approach i think the first uh the first point should be you know creating a community or business around something and uh, at that point, you know, you have the the option or, you know, could possibly benefit from having a currency to, you know, interact with your community or within that environment. So the, um, yeah, the idea of creating a currency isn't, you know, uh, bad, obviously. It's just that shouldn't be the first thing, I don't think. Yeah, follow-up question to that. What would you say around, so 
my definition of like what a currency would be is is elasticity right so it's like a rubber band you pull it out and it, and it expands as the community grows based off supply and demand economics and then it retracts based off of the supply and demand if the user base or the you know community shrinks at any given point but i, I haven't seen really the only project that i saw do it like relatively successfully was ample forth but they were pegged to the 2019 us dollar and so that it really kind of went away from the whole point of decentralization at that point because it became a it became a fluctuating currency that wasn't sustainable because it was only backed by the dollar which the dollar is not backed by anything right since the gold standard so what do you guys think about elasticity and its role um when it when it comes to actual like social currencies or communities that that build out a token economic model or even a dao format to be able to have that sustainability as the community grows and there's supply and demand then should the the amount of tokens increase as the community grows and then decrease as the community shrinks it's a um uh so speaking on uh elastic uh, elastic token models they are um they're they're relatively you know simple in nature but their implications and their methods of you know i i just say their 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 implications are very very uh hard to understand um but uh at the end of the day uh at the end of the day i think they are they are pointless they um you know they offset uh price with uh quantity you know you either have a thousand tokens at a dollar or one dollar that's worth or one token is worth a thousand dollars or something to the effect and what what the objective was with ample ample forth mimicking the you know u.s dollar in an elastic way uh, was uh, it's from the get-go it's it's impossible because the US dollar is an asset class a lot of people forget that but you know it's borderline 200 trillion dollars and so this asset class is so large that it becomes the baseline for what people view as stable uh, but you know still just another asset class still like you know Bitcoin fluctuating here and there it's just so massive that it fluctuates very little and the reason that the fluctuation is so massive is because the amount of people using it is is large. And so when you peg an asset, a smaller asset like Ampleforth to the U.S. dollar at a match, its volatility, all of that um, excess volatility that should be present in a smaller market uh, kind of leaks out of the system and as, as friction. And that's a hard concept to you know explain here. But uh, at the point of the, at the end of the day, you just can't match. You can't mimic the behavior of a large asset class uh, with a, a small one, it's uh, it's just not it's just not possible. And then speaking to the elastic model broadly, uh, it's something it's something I don't think most people will ever understand. But I was thinking about making a, a tool to help people understand this. And uh, if you just think about it in terms of you know you have your MetaMask wallet, if you just had a little JavaScript function running to uh, convert all of your your balances in whatever token to uh, some arbitrary new lower or higher number, you know, pegged to some baseline, uh, nothing, nothing has changed. You know, you still have the same amount of value. It's just now you've introduced, you know, a level of accounting complexity that's unnecessary. Uh, the, um, yeah, the elastic model doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't provide any value. It's just, you know, uh, volatility has been exchanged for value. That's it. Okay, gotcha, man. That makes sense. Um, I had a, a couple of ideas around elasticity, but I don't want to take up the, the panel the entire time. So, guys, thank you so much uh, for having me up. Um, Sertic, I saw you just unmuted, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the question, and thanks for the kind words, and we will connect with you uh, soon. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and alrighty. If Okay, so if nobody has any questions at all for, uh, you know, Snow Code and Sertic, um, we'll go ahead and end this AMA here. And so, you know, guys, Snow Code, Sertic, do you have any closing remarks before we wrap things up? Well, thanks everyone for attending um, this episode. It's been very, so uh, hopefully, uh, insightful and educating for the community. And, um, and thanks again to AVAX for partnering on this uh, podcast. I'll let, um, I'll let Tao to issue our closing remarks and set hog the mic. Yeah, um, just uh, make sure to follow both us and Certic, and uh, we're going to have some more news coming out on our beta launch. It's going to give uh, users an opportunity to earn some tokens, so just keep an eye on that.
Yep, that all sounds good. Make sure to follow everybody. Check out Sixer.com for any audits or any other any of our other services and a bunch of uh, resources for users to kind of learn a little bit more about what they can do to stay safe in the crypto space as well. And then I hope to see you all here next time for our next conversation. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the plan was to do this monthly, but now I think it's weekly. Um, and so we'll be here all day, all week. Um, I'll see you guys in our next one. Remember to uh, check out and join their Twitter, join their Telegram channel, Discord, Snowcone, and Static as well. Um, and uh, yeah, take care, guys.